A lot of discussion going on regarding transplant in myelofibrosis. And I was pleased that this year's TCT meeting, it's, it's, it's a key global meeting, to have an extended discussion as part of the meeting with my colleague, Gene Palmer, who focuses on stem cell transplant in myelofibrosis. And exactly this discussion uh, of which patients, you know, what impact are the drugs having? You know, what does the future hold? You know, we know it's a baseline for the field. We've got two approved JAK inhibitors, ruxolitinib and now fedratinib. Fedratinib now recently with its approval in Europe. Both improved splenomegaly, both improved symptoms. Ruxolitinib has been demonstrated improved survival. I suspect the same is true for fedratinib. It just hasn't been uh, proven yet in terms of the length of follow-up uh, of the data. Uh, we see that there is a very exciting pipeline of new therapies that have been discussed at ASH, whether it be new combinations up front uh, of a JAK inhibitor plus either Navitaclax or plus CPI-0610 that might broaden or deepen responses. And we see open discussion of survival improvements, both with long-term data from mamalitinib as well as uh, even differential dosing of a metal stat suggesting improvements in survival. Uh, Surge for Stopstix Group at MD Anderson presented data suggesting that over the last decade, survival for model fibrosis has improved prior to historical controls, and that being on JAK inhibition really has made a, an impact on that. So I think our medical therapies are having an impact. So how does that impact our decision-making regarding stem cell transplantation? Well, one, stem cell transplant continues to be a very important option for patients with myelofibrosis. And there's been further refinement of our way to prognosticate myelofibrosis and even prognostic scores that take into consideration some of the factors related to uh, transplant itself to suggest who really might benefit from transplantation. So one, there's been that refinement in that decision-making process. Two, there's been optimization of the pre-transplant therapy. Uh, almost all patients will receive JAK inhibition prior to transplant, that's probably beneficial. Uh, and we've learned over time that likely the best outcomes of transplant come from individuals who receive transplant when it's not used as a last ditch or salvage therapy. So in other words, if you've had a JAK inhibitor, you're having an optimal response, you were a good candidate for transplant, move forward with that transplant. Delaying until loss of response or progression are uh, also a, a big concern. Now, the other thing that's impacting our transplanting decision is there are times transplant has been delayed and we want to use transplant as salvage. Let's say it's not ideal, but if that's the situation we're in, we obviously want to make the best of it that we can. Well, now we have many new second line therapies in development for MF that might lead to a deeper impact and, and might set patients up toward greater success with transplantation. So might that be with IMG7289, the LSD1 inhibitor with good activity in the second line, uh, or CPI0610, uh, or Navitaclax, either alone or in combination with a JAK inhibition, or uh, MDM2 inhibitors, uh, or uh, other such approaches, or perhaps a second line JAK inhibitor, such as fedratinib, which is now approved, mamalitinib in the case of anemia in particular, pacaritinib for individuals with marked thrombocytopenia. So I think a lot of nuances evolving in terms of how do we optimize these evolving medical options with the process of transplantation. I don't think it's really a question of either or. I think it's a question of really how do we optimize uh, pre-transplant therapy, the transplant itself, and in the future, how do we optimize post-transplant therapy?